Hello, I'm Phil Hawkins, director, and this is a video about how to direct one-shot scenes, or what are also called developing masters. You see on the screen here uh, three scenes from a film I directed for Universal and Sky called Prancer, A Christmas Tale. And obviously these are all sped up uh, to give you a sense of the flow. I've chosen these scenes because I wanted to show a couple of different reasons why you might do uh, a one-shot scene. So um, I'm going to go into these scenes in detail and break down uh, the shot list and blocking plans of how we did the scenes and there's some behind the scenes videos as well. So the three scenes I'm going to focus on in this video are not the only um, developing masters I have in Prancer. Uh, I'm a big Spielberg fan. Uh, that was kind of my film school growing up so I feel like I have the continuous master style in my bones but of course Spielberg and other filmmakers before him are, are the absolute masters and genius at uh, blocking and doing these kinds of scenes. Okay, so here we go. So this is the first scene we're going to focus on. And this is um, early on in the film. It's basically the first scene where the entire family are together and they're making breakfast. Um, now, uh, <laughs> this is a kind of scene that you look at in a script that's got multiple characters sat around a table talking to, to, to each other. And it's just coverage hell. The amount of shots you need to cover all the eye lines across the table would take forever. And to be honest, is a boring way to shoot this scene. Very possible, but not very cinematic. So how do I go about it? Well, first of all, uh, I start with something like this, which is a shot list. I do this in a piece of software called shot lister and uh, as you can see here that you know I had different parts of the one shot uh, as a kind of shorthand for me to remember in a shot list and then here the key thing sequence is or and maybe a few extra bits of coverage that I might have needed um, if the scene didn't quite go well on the day because obviously this is ages for in terms of prep um, and then what I do is um, write down the specifics of the blocking um, broken up into parts so you see here this kind of bullet points which some of it might make sense some of it might not make sense um, but they're a shorthand for me that when I get the actors I'm able to follow this and remember what it is that I was thinking um, and then this translates into um, blocking plans this is made from a piece of software called Shot Designer by Hollywood Camera Work uh, and it allows you to do these diagrams I already knew the dimensions and layout of the set uh, by now. So uh, that's what the outline that you're seeing. And then I broke this scene down into four parts uh, about where the camera moves um, and where the blocking of all the actors is. It looks quite complicated at a first glance, but actually when you compare it to the kind of bullet pointed list, uh, it sort of starts to make sense. The scene, once we blocked it, did um, change a little bit um, because once you get the actors and once you realise where you can and can't put the camera, um, that can change things. So how do we do it? Here's a few um, behind-the-scenes angles of how this was put together. And we used a Ronin, um, basically attached to a bit of scaffold that allowed us to move back down the table over the heads of the actors and then you'll see in a sec the scaffold magically removes uh, is removed and so the uh, ronin is more flexible i'm including the blocking plan here and uh in terms of the chart and the bullet points so you can compare um but essentially f for me looking at these scenes that they have the camera has to always be motivated by movement um and story so the idea is that, you know, here, for example, Bud is separated from the family. He's side profile. He's kind of dissociated um, from them. And then the camera, as he pulls himself into the table, comes around and reveals Claire. Um, now, if you look at the behind the scenes and uh, see what the actors are having to do to time their movement coming in and out, uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll see that it's uh, like there, for example, uh, a chair is having to be moved back for the camera to be able to get round so it looks like it's coming across the table and then the chair is tucked back in later on for when Erica sits back down. There you go. Um, it's a beautiful ballet. It's a dance between the actors and the camera. 
And hopefully what comes across as effortless in the film is actually quite a technical thing to do. Uh, I remember blocking, show, <laughs> coming up with this scene, uh, rehearsing with the actors and then the grip coming in. I said, I kind of want to put the camera here and move it around here and do this. And he originally looked at me and said, no, it's impossible. <laughs> you need to put some cuts in. Um, and then uh, I took no for an answer and there was a bit of head scratching and then we came up with the wonderful uh, high-tech idea of, of um, having a bit of scaffold. So yeah, so so end up being a lovely scene um, that uh, I'm very proud of and I'm sure the actors are too. Erica, please, leave it be. Dad. So our next scene uh, was about establishing geography. Uh, this is the first time we see this hardware store set in the film. And uh, for me, it was important just to establish the different areas that of the, of the store that are going to uh, be important later on. Um, and also there was kind of a lot of sort of bitty action as scripted. So I wanted to, a way of connecting everything together in an organic flow. Um, so here's the camera move that actually was exactly the same the only change was originally i thought i might have to do it on a crane or an arm uh here um and sort of track across to find it but we ended up just doing it on a ronin which was a simpler and easier solution um and the thing that changed here actually was originally i was only going to do half of this scene in one shot but once we got there and started blocking um it made sense just to carry on the scene um and do it as a wanna. So again, here's the blocking movement. Here are the kind of two plans um, because the block and the actors remain the same. You can see here simple things like the handover of the Ronin over the table um, and uh, you know the cooling of the lights uh, to, uh, to uh, capture this sort of scene. Obviously the timing of Bud coming across the street was important and had to be perfect. Uh, which, of course, being you know the legendary Mr. James Cromwell, uh, nailed it every time. So that's this is where it was supposed to cut, but it just felt wrong to cut when suddenly we've been kind of building this action. And um, so, uh, so I carried on, basically carried on and, and combined the moves that I planned uh, that were actually just going to be you know more standard coverage later into this shot. You see here, it became a two shot, the, the uh, panda's background from chucking it out, closing the door, and then that ended up being uh, the end of the scene. And knowing when to end these scenes is almost as important as when to start them and when to use them. And our third and final scene, uh, probably our longest one in the film, essentially just a two-hander between uh, James Cromwell and uh, Aaron McCusker, a father and son scene which is a really pivotal scene for their relationship in the film. Um, and they're two absolutely brilliant actors. So for me, reading the script, this was always going to be uh, a one-shot scene. And it was important to make that decision very early on so the actors knew that I was planning to do this uh, in a one -er, so they could absolutely nail their lines. Because, you know, there's not only the pressure of, of the camera team having to... Uh, capture a scene like this is that the actors know that the pressure is on that they if they fluff a line the whole thing starts again now i mean these guys were great and we only did i think probably three takes maybe of this this whole scene um in the end it uh was one of those times when actually my plan didn't work <laughs> so um it it you can see, obviously, it can be. I'm very well prepped, and I, I have a blocking plan, a shot list, and and an idea of how I want the scene to be. Um, but once you start working with the actors, they also have a perspective on the scene, and it was um, Jamie who, once I started blocking the scene, said actually he felt it was really important to stay standing for longer. Um, uh, because of the status of the scene involved um, them to be uh, at odds and then almost equal and then for the kind of power shift to change, which all relates, its status and power all relates to blocking. Um, and he was right. He was absolutely right. So I cried internally 
<laughs> that I planned this amazing shot. Um, and now I can't do it because um, one of my actors doesn't want to s stand or sit down um, at the point that I thought they might. Now, um, and that's their prerogative. I mean, the, the worst things about doing, the worst thing you can do as a director is to force a one-shot scene because you'll end up doing hundreds of takes <laughs> because the blocking isn't organic. You know, their, their movement isn't motivated by their character or where they feel that they should be in a scene on a set, you know. Um, and uh, so it's very important to discuss the blocking and work with the actors to do this so it actually feels right when they're doing it um, because that's when mistakes can happen and that's when you, you know, have to do multiple takes. Um, so, it, and I was very willing for such an important scene to throw out my whole, you know, beautiful one shot idea that I've been, you know, planning for weeks um, because the performance is everything. Um, and it could have been, you know, a more conventionally um, shot scene. Um, but, you know, so I just blocked it normally and in the way that I, you know, we all felt worked for the scene and worked for the characters and worked for, you know, what we were trying to say. Uh, with the blocking of the scene and 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 you know the status shift, the power shift within it uh, between these two characters, um, and um, I said, "Great, thank you very much." They stepped away, <laughs> and then I scratched my head uh, for what felt like an eternity, but probably was only about five minutes, and and rethought the entire shot. So if you go back and look at the blocking plans, you can see that it, it was entirely different. And this shot that I came up with was pretty much on the day, um, you know, with the pressure of the crew and the schedule and everyone waiting <laughs> for me to uh, figure this out. Um, and, you know, and again, hats off to my amazing camera team and, you know, my direct photography, James Oldham, who... I don't know how he lit the scene and made it look beautiful uh, as a 360 from all angles, but he managed it. And there's not a lighting stand in sight, but obviously that is a set and all lit and uh, looked um, gorgeous. So, so thank you to my camera team for that. Thanks for watching. Uh, please do subscribe. And if you want more of these deep dives, let me know in the comments and uh, I'll try and make a few more videos.